there's a lot being said everywhere about the importance of data modeling. Data modeling is a crucial skill both for software and data engineers. The problem is most of the time we kind of can be a little forced to move faster than we should and often we build bad data models or maybe never even take the time to learn why we have various patterns and methods in place to try to develop things that capture what the business is doing. So in this video, we're gonna start talking about data modeling so you can start understanding what all these terms mean and also how you can be better at it. Honestly, this whole uh, series was inspired by two very scary data models that I've seen both on the OLTP and OLAP side recently for two of my clients. Um, and it, yeah, it scared me so much that I feel like I have to make a video about it. Now, if you're new to this channel, hey there guys, my name is Ben Rogjan, uh, also known as uh, AKA the CL Data Guy. I have been working in data for nearly 10 years uh, as a data engineer, data analyst, now as a data consultant, helping companies set up their data infrastructure, which often involves at some point a data model. And again, recently in the past few weeks, uh, on the OLTP side, I, some, I saw something that looked a little like this, where course underscore ID one, under, ID two, ID three, until like 35. And another one where they, on the analytical side, uh, where someone had uh, one essentially customer field for every customer. Great, this is a customer table, right? No, this is everything. This is one big table done to the extreme, uh, where all the transactions are literally stored in a single column and you're scaring me people. So. What I want to do is go through a video of what <laughs> data modeling is, some of the basics, and hopefully go over some design patterns and why it's important to actually understand what we're doing here. I think many of us, if you took a database course, um, did a little bit of some level of data modeling for a relational database, but it feels like much of that can sometimes be given up because we're trying to develop products faster, we're, we're being agile, we're, we're putting out MVPs, and we're, we're rarely stopping to think about what this is actually supposed to represent. Um, and as Joe Rees recently said um, during uh, the conference we had. Once you've normalized your data, you can now denormalize it, right? An example is a Kimball star schema. In order to denormalize, uh, you need to have normalized first. So let's dive into it. All right. So in order to understand data modeling, I think it's important to understand what that even means. Now, if you ask Tech Target, what they're going to say data modeling is, is that it is the process of creating a simplified diagram of a software system and, and its data elements. Uh, that it contains using text symbols uh, to represent the data and how it flows, essentially acting as the blueprint uh, for a new database or re-engineering of a legacy system. Or if you ask Joe Reese, uh, he basically put it as um, organizing and standardizing data to facilitate believable and useful information uh, and knowledge for humans and machines. And he added the end, add machines part recently because of things like ChatGPT. So basically the goal and the way I look at it is data modeling is meant to take all of the data that you're trying to collect uh, about your business and serve it in a usable way into systems. And then also from there eventually into, you know, analytics, right? Like it needs to represent what's happening in the business. It is a derivative of what is occurring in the business. That is what you're trying to model in these data models. The data itself is actually the stuff that flows into them, but that shell, that outer thing you're trying to model is all of that stuff, relationships, actions, things that occur in your business need to be tracked. And that's what you're trying to do. If you have a business that does transactions, you're trying to capture those transactions, understand who created those transactions, who was involved in those transactions, what product was purchased from that transaction, was it a certain location? You know, there are layer upon layers of what you're trying to understand. And the key is you're trying to conceptually grasp all that. And it's very arguably difficult to do. So that's why generally when you look at the standard approach to data modeling, there is three layers to it, which is conceptual data modeling, logical data modeling, and physical data modeling. But most of us just jump right into the physical. We start writing queries. We're like, we already know what we're doing. You know, we've, we've read a book on Kimball. We know what we're doing, but it goes so much deeper than that. Data modeling does not start data engineers would like to think at the data warehousing uh, step, right? Data modeling happens at the business and then goes into the system, the operational system, and then eventually some, at some point ends up in the data warehouse. So what you're trying to do again is break it down into those three uh, layers of data modeling, conceptual, logical, physical, starting from the operational system, trying to understand the concepts that exist in your data model. So let's go over that. So conceptual data modeling, that's what we'll talk about first. 
This is where you're really trying to focus on abstractly understanding what is going on in the business. You know, you have customers, those customers purchase a product, those products exist in shelves that are at stores. Those stores are often, you know, fed by distributors. You've got all of these big subject areas and big entities that exist. And that's generally why you'll often see people use some sort of ER diagram or entity relationship diagram to be part of this conceptual step phase. And this is where, you know, you can kind of just keep filling it out. You're just constantly adding more and more color to this uh, model. And the first part, you're really just trying to make it something that if you hand it to a business person, they understand what they're looking at, right? You're trying to make it so that it looks like something that they understand. Um, there are arguments in terms of like how much information should be covered in your ER or UML type design. But I think the key point is that the business needs to be involved and they need to understand what's going on. So if you've got something that no one understands what is going on, you know, maybe you need to adjust your conceptual model. It's just too, you know, too specific. It's got too much, you know, it's got foreign keys in there, primary keys in there. And it's like, let's get rid of attributes and let's just show the entities and what's happening in between them right? Like, okay, again, customer buys a product, um, that product, etc., sits on a shelf. You can even write it to that degree. And we'll give a few examples here of different conceptual diagrams. Now you get to the logical step. And this is what you might call like the previous was what, this is the how, right? This is how the system should be uh, built, not necessarily taking into consideration your, you know, database management system that you're going to be using. You should be able to just have this high level understanding of what it's going to look like. It'll have the different relationships outlined. You'll have more flavor kind of started to add in there, like primary keys, foreign keys. Are there some self-referencing uh, moments where uh, an entity needs to reference itself? But in general, again, at this phase, you're not adding in things like ints and floats and really trying to add in the, the code side of things just yet. You don't know the physical side. You don't know where it's going to live. You don't know what it's going to look like in terms of data types. You haven't written code yet. So you're just kind of defining this next step. And then the physical side, this is where we all like to dive in. You're starting to define what different data types are. You're starting to define how it's going to exist in reality. What's it going to be built in? And, and that's kind of this final step before you really start putting it into practice. Now, as you're doing that, you're going to realize you're going to take certain steps. Part of the reason that you go through this process, let's give you some whys here, is because you're going to one, figure out how far you want to abstract things, right? When you create a table, do you have a table for employee and another table for customer? Or do you actually abstract it further to person? And that's, you know, it's just person and that's what it is, right? Like what is the way you're going to abstract things? How far, how far is too far, right? Are you just gonna have a things table? Is there just gonna be a table for things um, or people or some very vast generalization that's going to be very difficult eventually to work with, right? Like what is the level of essentially generalization that is too far. An example of often generalization that sometimes is required is the custom field uh, generalization that you'll often see, which is, you know, maybe you have an entity um, that exists. And on top of that, you want customers, people to add in custom fields to that entity. Now, instead of making them have to impact the database and add, you know, constant um, new fields uh, to a table somehow in your process, generally what a lot of people will do and a lot of the designs I've seen is you will have another table and in that table you will have essentially the custom fields so you'll have entity id uh, that exists uh, the custom field essentially id especially if you're building that into a system where it's like that custom field is going to exist for all of those similar entities and then likely what that is right like and if you want to really want to add in more into it you're gonna have a center table in there that acts as kind of the relationship table where you've got uh, entity id custom field id and then that essentially will act as um, the gap between that and then the actual table. And I'll put up some diagrams here um, and some notes. And so this is an example of like, okay, how, when do you need to generalize and when do you need not to? You're trying to capture some information that is very custom. And if you're using a relational database, you're likely gonna do this. Obviously, if you're using something like MongoDB or a different database, it's gonna act different, but again, different uh, solutions for different uh, databases. Now that we've gone over those basic concepts, um, let's talk about another important concept, normalization and denormalization. These are just terms that you get asked uh, about during an interview. Like what's the difference? Why would you do one or the other? These are very important things to understand why they exist and what you know purpose they serve. Yes, normalization exists to reduce 
duplication of data and increase the data integrity in relational database models. That's the goal. We often use it because in transaction systems, they tend to provide more performant results as well as minimize unexpected results and anomalies because you don't have data that is duplicated across multiple tables, which then requires you to update multiple locations anytime uh, anything is done. So when you hear the term normalization, you'll often also hear things like first, second, and third normal form as long, as well as with a few other normal forms, but uh, generally at the very least you'll hear to a third normal form. And basically each of these are steps that are used to reduce often duplication or risk of something strange happening. Generally, let's first break down these various normal forms and kind of what you'll see characteristic wise. So when you hear first normal form, that basically refers to the fact that a single cell shouldn't have more than one value in it. Uh, I've had this happen. I remember I worked at a company where they had like project ID and they had multiple project IDs that existed in one cell and it was super, it was a pain to work with. To the essentially there must be a primary key that will act as identification. Uh, and you, you try to re remove the need for duplicate rows or columns. Now, when you hear a second normal form, um, the first assumption is that things are in first normal form. You've already normalized to that level. The second goal is that there's essentially either no non-prime or no dependency of the values in those tables that really shouldn't exist. I mean, that's the simplest way to put it. If you read this in a lot of places, what they'll say is that there'll be no partial, essentially, a dependency on primary keys. That is to say that if there's values in that table, they shouldn't just partially be like part of this thing. An example of this is somewhere where maybe you're trying to capture essentially uh, an employee that works in multiple locations, right? Like maybe you've got some sort of business that has multiple locations. So you've got employee ID, you've got location ID, and then maybe the employee's age in that table. Now you've got a strange uh, dependency where yes, sort of this employee worked at that location and that is their age, but age should really be pulled out into a separate entity, probably just around for employee. And then another table should be created for essentially the employee and the location that they're working at, at on different days. And for now, we're going to kind of stop at third normal form. You know, we're going to talk about it right now. Uh, but for third normal form, basically the goal is you basically want to, uh, one, again, be in second normal form. And then two, the goal is that there shouldn't be essentially some sort of transitive dependency for attributes that are not prime, or essentially the ones that aren't really related to key thing you're trying to focus on in this table. The example you'll see everywhere, I think, and it's just the easiest to understand, um, is location data. So maybe you might have information such as, you know, an employee uh, ID, some information about who they are, which all depends on that employee ID. Great. But now you might have things like zip code, state, and other information that's also added on there. Well, the all that information, right, can maybe be summed up by one of those components, right? Maybe you know everything you need to know just based off the zip code, right? Like maybe that's efficient enough to then know the state you're in, to know the city you're in. Um, and so that's can be put into a different table where it's more like addresses. And why this is important is now you're removing the need for redundancy of the same information, right? Like, okay, we're gonna have the same, we know that, you know, whatever that zip code is, exists somewhere and we're very aware of which state it's in and we don't need to have it repeated over and over again. You know, one of the reasons that normalization exists is that it helps save space. And so, although this might seem like a silly thing, like it's like, well, we could just put it in there anyways, it doesn't matter, you know, how often do we update this information? Uh, in this case, you know, when you're talking about location data, what you might actually be trying to do is just not so much save in terms of like updates and weird anomalies, but maybe what you're trying to do uh, is avoid taking up extra space with that information, right? So that's going to take up a decent amount of space uh, if every uh, employee or customer has the same data over and over again uh, for their location of where they live. So that's just an example of why people would do it. Now, when it comes to speed, right, what is faster to join across two tables uh, to pull on that information or just to get that ID and now you have all the information with you. And, and that's why you'll often hear on the other side of this, the concept of denormalization. And that's why in particular, you'll often hear this uh, in data warehousing because we want to have some level of denormalization because those queries tend to run slightly faster. And obviously, again, the trade-offs in these cases is we're going to increase redundancy, uh, which can lead to weird anomalies and increase your overall storage costs. But it can make a lot of sense when your data systems are very read heavy. Whereas in general, you know, when you have operational systems, they are probably heavy on both, both read and write and updates and everything, more than likely, uh, for your data warehouse, the main thing is to write 
once and then read many times, right? Like that's generally the thought. Or you're gonna write, you know, maybe once every so often, unless you've got real time data. Um, it just isn't as focused on writing and inserting new data. Really, a lot of this is done by, and those performance trade-offs that you gain are done by reducing the need for joins. So what often happens in a normalized model is you'll have this relationship that in order to get to a field, again, like address, it's going to be several fields away, right? For some reason, you've normalized it to the point where it's like, okay, we've got employee ID, so we know with who the employee is. Okay, now we've got like maybe their zip code and then okay, we go from there to the next level. And then maybe for some reason, they've even gone one level deeper, uh, right? Like maybe they created a state table. So in order to even get like the state that this exists in, you've gone three or four tables deep just to get to that information. And that doesn't make sense as much when you want to read a lot and don't want to do all these joins. So that's one of the main reasons you'll see denormalization occur is that you're trying to make reads easier. It is the reversing of normalization. It is something that can only be done if you have once at some point normalized your data. So that's why when you see a data warehouse or even things like one big table, these are heavily or at least slightly denormalized systems. Uh, one big table to the nth degree, right, is, is a denormalized table or denormalized way of showing your data um, rather than having Again, a customer table that's separate. All of your customer information is just in one one giant row, as well as the transaction. So every time you have a transaction, you have all of the customer data as well, which is kind of nice to a degree because you don't have to join it to anything. But in other degrees, right? Like if that customer moves or if something needs to be updated uh, in the past, you need to now update 30 different rows because there's 30 different transactions. Whereas in a normalized system, you know, that update occurs once in one location likely. And so that's why you have this trade-off. And now this was a really long video. I really just wanted to hammer the point of conceptual, logical, physical modeling. And I also wanted to really discuss kind of the normalization and we've covered a lot of those basics. Now we can start looking at actual data models and how to do it, right? I didn't want to run into, let's just go into physical modeling because we have no idea what we're doing. Let's really talk about these high level concepts that then we can use to build out the next few layers. And we'll cover those in the next few videos. So first off, thanks so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. If you're out there wondering how to data model, um, I'll also talk about some books that you can use. But for now, I'm going to sign off and say thanks so much for watching, guys, and see y'all and goodbye.